you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here with a brand new novel for you. We are discussing The Devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino, the third of the Detective Galileo series. Despite what Western publishers might tell you, Herds, I have been having such a blast reading this book, and you're in the hot seat for this one. How have you been finding it? What a question. I've been loving this book. I cannot tell you how disappointed and devastated I was when I had to put this book down so we could record this episode. I want to get to the next part. Flex, oh. I, I've been enjoying this so much. This, this, You have picked, I would say, the perfect book for me. Um, it's about, like relationships between characters and we have a very small cast Mm -hmm. and there's no time puzzles whatsoever and we even already know who the culprit is so my job's gonna be really easy this time around very easy like i cannot tell you how straightforward everything is for me and i'm loving it flex uh yeah (laughs) i don't know it's a 10 out of 10 already we're only seven chapters in so, before we get any further in, we should address that if you buy this from Western Publishers, I believe this is the first of three books that have been translated. Uh, the series is actually a lot longer in Japan. This is the third one. It st- started with Detective Galileo. Just confusing. Uh, and then all of the rest of the titles are terribly poorly translated on Google Translate here. I am in the process of trying to get some proper translations done so we can talk more about this later. Because, oh my goodness, the details on Japanese Wikipedia for this novel are enticing her. It sounds like they drama. They are enticing. It sounds like wonderful Japanese drama, and that's very popular. So I, I can only imagine it'll it'll boost our ratings right up. But yeah, you're, yeah. you're totally right. <laughs> our murder happens on screen. We yeah. spend, you know, a good couple of chapters getting to know uh, Ishigami, the math teacher who lives next to Yasuko Hanaka, who's he, who he's sweet on. And then all of a sudden, Yasuko and her daughter murder Yasuko's ex-husband. Yep. And sure Ishigami so. comes in to help them out. And it it is then our detective uh Kusanagi trying to track down the uh the other three characters. Yeah, I mean, this is a really weird choice to have on this murder mission show, but that's okay. I think I think I can see some twistings and and turnings happening in the novel already, and we're only seven chapters in, so I am I am looking forward to that. But yeah, I mean the story opens in a very human way, right? We get to see the moments leading up to the the grisly murder, um, in a in a kind of backwards, you know, normally we're trying to figure out who did the murder and how and why, but in this one we know why and how and who. It was it was Yasuko and her and her daughter Masato in in their house with a telephone cord, I believe. Is it a telephone cord? It's like a cooking implement. Maybe it was a cooking implement. It was some kind of cord. Doesn't matter. It was strangled. Yeah. Point is, uh, yeah, this guy has apparently tracked them down, um, this, this ex-husband. It seems like he's going to kill little Masato, this, like, young girl. And Mama Bear goes full ham. Look, I can respect that. Yeah. <laughs> I can respect that. And I don't know. That's That's the setup for this. So I'm sure that all these details will be, you know, instrumental in the t- Detective Galileo, uh, aka Yukawa Manabu, uh, uncovering the truth down the line. But the the way that this novel begins, in both a very human way, but also a very kind of analytical mm-hmm. way. You know, in most murder mysteries, we tend to, you know, analyze the puzzle through the eyes of the the Sherlock or the detective character, right? And then you have the Watson that kind of humanizes them and brings that other side of the story. Yeah. But in this story, um, our three criminal characters kind of are the ones su- supplying that. Like Ishigami is the, the puzzle character and our other, you know, primary murder suspect, Yasuko, uh, is, you know, bringing the more human element, which I find to be very a very interesting way to kind of frame the crime. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things coming into the Detective Galileo series in the third book for Western readers is that you don't know Detective Galileo. Yeah. And I think that these this stretch of chapters towards the end does a really good job of introducing him in comparison to his former classmate, Ishigami. Exactly, yeah. And it's really fun because uh, Yukawa, Detective Galileo, is a really human detective. Mm-hmm, he is. Like, the, the really interesting framing device here is that on both sides of the equation, on the, the <laughs> heroes and villains uh-huh. side, let's say, we pun. have uh, Yasuko, who's very human, uh, and we have Ishigami, who's very robotic. And then on the 
hero's side per se we have uh kusanagi who is very robotic and uh kind of just caught in a job and then yukawa who is a university professor associate professor he's a physicist yeah and you know he's very human and adventurous and when we look at through flashbacks at his history with ishigami there's some really nice moments of characterization there oh my goodness the way that the narrator shout out to david pitu uh, he plays both Ishigami and and Detective Galileo, you know, in the same scene with them talking to each other, and they could not sound more different, right? Like, I can feel the discomfort, I can feel the, the deception being played on both sides as this cat and mouse game begins with the two squaring off against each other. And in the story, they're discussing, like, the, the four-color map problem, like, that you're trying to color in the global map, um, only using four colors. That's like the problem they're discussing. Ishigami, uh, he wants to figure it out himself with his own hands because the, the discussion that they're having about is essentially mathematical problems that can be theoretically solved, but they you do it with a computer. That's how you prove that they can be solved. And Ishigami isn't satisfied with that. Whereas uh, Galileo says, well, I don't need to actually know all the intricacies of the problem. All I need to know is that this is the solution or that it can be solved at all. Um, and I, I love that distinction. And it is, the other thing that's good is that compared to other mysteries that bring in, you know, mathematics problems and science issues, because this scene is framed as a discussion between two massive nerds who have a unique <laughs> shared it's passion it's very good it's used to create that tension you were talking about when you were complimenting the narrator yeah where even though they're just going over mathematics problems and physics problems you could kind of see the interplay between the characters in how the issue is discussed yes, yes. and it's not something that i have like legitimately i have ever seen any author being able to pull off as effectively as Keiko Higashino does it here. And <laughs> I don't know who translated the edition that I have, but shout out to them as well, because yeah. pulling this off both in a novel to begin with and then in a translated novel is just an achievement. I mean, the way that the two characters employ deception against each other is notably different. And it, again, is reflective of the way that they both approach problems. Yeah. Whereas Ishigami is saying... What is the logical thing to say at this given moment? What is the optimal thing to, to drop into this conversation to have said? Yeah. Whereas the deception that Galileo plays upon his friend. Now, we're only seven chapters in, so I'm not sure how this is fully going to shake out, but he basically makes it so that his his mathematical friend is solving this, this mass problem that he brings to him from his professor. It's a different problem, not the four-color problem. It doesn't matter what the problem is. But he brings it to him and has him work on it for the entire night. And so then when, when Ishigami solves it, he goes, oh, look, see you, Kawa. I've solved the math problem. He says, oh, man, I was just sleeping. Oh, it's, uh, that's crazy. Oh, man, it's so early in the morning. You've been up all this time. Da, 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 da. And it turns out, of course, by the end of the scene, Ishigami realizes that he was awake, like, the entire time. Yeah. And that not only has he, you know, spent all this time here um, sort of spying on Ishigami to just see how he, like, works through his problem, but he also knows what time his neighbor, Yasuko, the primary suspect in the murder, gets out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And it's something that he kind of offhandedly says to Ishigami, and Ishigami's just, that's weird that it took so long. It's weird that he stuck around. It's weird that he wasn't sleeping the entire time, but he doesn't seem to fully <laughs> comprehend Galileo's kind of roundabout way of gathering information. Yeah. Right. It's so good because very good. there are so many moments in this book where characters will point out like, oh, it's good. It felt like he didn't know this thing. Yeah. And the way that the novel toys with your doubt on whether or not that character did know that thing is just such a brilliant part of the tension. Yeah. Before we move on, though, speaking of elegant solutions, though, <laughs> Herds, I yeah. did want to bring up and shout out one thing sure. that Keiko Higashino did here that- I wish more mystery authors did, uh, in addition to what I said earlier, mind you. <laughs> but that is that one of my pet peeves with murder mystery, and it, it was kind of cute when I was first getting into the genre, was the way that so many authors would mention other authors and other characters from the mystery canon explicitly yeah. and bring them up as examples of other things that had happened. Mm -hmm. For example, 
Sir Arthur Conan Doyle brings up Emile Gaborio, yeah. and then S.S. Van Dyne brings up G.K. Chesterton, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's just back and forth over and over between all of these authors. Shout out to Keigo Higashino for getting his little fandom out in the opening two pages of the book <laughs> by choosing to set it in Edogawa, I which know. is a real place, and having it be next to Seicho Park, as in Seicho Matsumoto. Yeah, it's very clever. Like, I'm sure there are other names in here that I haven't recognized, but it's so much cleaner than just breaking the fourth wall yeah, yeah, yeah and especially for a novel that leans on tension so much breaking the fourth wall is a dangerous thing to do in something as tense as this yeah and i'm grateful that kego has picked a much more tasteful in my opinion route of shouting out his heroes yeah the the overall kind of tone of the story as you say is it's very like it's much more down to earth i think than than some of the other stories we've covered and i do admire the cleanness there's really there's only five six characters that's that matter in this story and one of them's dead already it, it realizes the world in a more realistic way um because we know the schedules of the characters and we know that they have a life outside of just being in a murder mystery right yeah they have they have stuff to do which i, I really appreciate anyhow we are flex and herds you're listening to death of the reader we are discussing the devotion of suspect x chapters one to seven by keigo higashino and we'll be back in just a second You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here. Right now, we are going to be jumping over to our chat with Stella Duffy, who we recently had on exclusively on the podcast to talk in full about Money in the Morgue, which is our second book this year. Here is a snippet from that chat. It is currently up directly before this show on the podcast, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to be moving it back down the list to Money in the Morgue. So if you're catching up on this show and you've just found this, go back, have a listen to that full show. It's an amazing chat, and here is one of our favorite parts of it. No spoilers. Don't worry. Here's just a portion of that chat. For me, when I read really well, murder mysteries, but really any novel, I'm always looking at the characters. I'm a very character-focused reader, I guess, because is, I'm always looking is. for, you know, not not just to empathize with the detective or the antagonist in a twist, but like if every character on the page, and I think that is something that you've really achieved with this book, you've written almost every character to be sympathetic in some way. Um, although I do, I do want to say I have a score to say with Flex here because <laughs> he actually solved the mystery for this, which I'm very annoyed at. You know, I thought I'd catch you with all his love stuff, but one of the keys for Flex actually solving this mystery uh, was the inclusion of the character list. So I have to ask Stella, when you included this list, did you think it would be used to solve the mystery? Not to use it. I knew it was going uh-huh. to be useful to people like <laughs> you guys who think of these things. Uh-huh. I put it in because she had it in her notes. And because I thought it was appropriate and because I thought it was, it was, it was, we didn't cut any of her stuff. Some of her stuff has changed a bit to make it, hey, this is weird. I'm actually feeling quite emotional about this because I really wanted to do justice to what she had left. Okay, I'm surprised to be feeling emotional, but I honestly, and it felt wrong to cut that. Right. And not all of the names and some, some extra names, because like she had different names for Sarah and she had different names for Luke. So the, the dramatic person I isn't as she wrote it, but it was in her notes. So I had to leave it. I had to hope that most people don't look at it. And and so I put that in. I mean, I thought it would have been wrong to not use what she had done. So like and there's also people who think that so good good reads. There's also people who think the title is terrible. Why isn't it Money in the Morgue? A murder in the morgue. Why would you call it Money in the Morgue? Because she did. Because she did. That was her title. I'm not going to change her title. I mean, come on. And I think I think that is a great yeah. point about this book is that for all that it does, for all that it changes, for all of the things where I, I where Goodreads comes in and says you've ruined Marsh, I think you've done an excellent job being <laughs> <laughs> Some people do think I'm amazing. I find it really weird. Well, where in that really- camp? <laughs> <laughs> there, you're very kind. Um, I, I genuinely, for me, I would rather it was divided than they didn't care. But the best, the best bit, right, is that it. it some people said it sent them back to read her, and that was why HarperCollins wanted to do it, and that was why I wanted to do it. It is. It is. Really unfortunate that unlike Christy, she didn't have kids. 
the Christie estate. I mean, Christie's grandson, Matthew, has done an amazing job with her estate. He has been able to keep it going, to keep the story going. Du Maurier's family did the same. She didn't have people to do this for her. And a lot of her friends and colleagues in New Zealand, in Christchurch, the people who look after the Noam Marsh House Trust, who were very helpful to me, they have done as much as they could, but it's not the same. And they've never been given the kind of support I mean, it's kind of weird in New Zealand. I think they're getting a bit better. But, you know, everyone's all over Catherine Mansfield, who is an amazing writer. But there's this really phenomenally successful person who was internationally successful and one of the first women ever to sell a million and Creative New Zealand and the New Zealand versions of Arts Council and Government haven't supported her legacy in the same way. I think that's a real shame. And so... But she, because she didn't have kids, because she didn't have grandkids to push this, her, her voice and her name has been much less pushed aside than Christie's. And, and people don't know about the four queens of crime. You know, they know about Christie. And that's a real pity. Yeah. And I mean, it's there's so much to say for how authors are treated past their lifetime. Oh, yeah. And when oh, we yeah. look at so many other great artists, but it's it, for me as a reader, it's really inspiring having people like yourself and the team at HarperCollins come along to put these things together in a way that doesn't feel like the kind of trashy reboots you'd get in something like cinema. This feels like a really legit story. And that's something, that's something to treasure whether or not you're part of the other half of Goodreads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, worst half. Let's be clear. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, but I mean, people people can have their opinion, and they should, right? They really 100%. should. And and as somebody yeah. who likes it, when I get good reviews, I can't then say I don't. You know, I shouldn't get bad ones. <laughs> either you go, either you don't pay attention to any reviews, or you pay attention to all of them, and that's totally fair enough. What I, I mean, I'm really glad you mentioned the team at HarperCollins because. I think that what they're doing with their continuation novels, and it does annoy some people. There are some people who think it should never happen. One of the, the things that made me very happy about when this book came out was that somebody who has um, been very rude about some of the continuation novels, let's just leave it like that, actually said that this changed his mind about what they were doing at HarperCollins and thought that it was worthwhile after all. So that was nice for me. But I, I think that... that we just live in a culture where people want you. And it doesn't matter if you say you haven't read this novel, it's from 1932. People are going to go, well, I still want one from 2021. So if somebody reapproaches a writer and fashions their work in a way that is still accessible to someone now, but with the tone of what they were doing, and if that then leads them back, I think that's so valuable. Definitely. And I think it's so useful because... You know, there are so many writers and so many of us making new work. And we live in a culture that wants the new all the time. There's all this previous work. We could stop writing now, all of us. We could never write again and there'd still be more novels than any one of us could ever read in a dozen lifetimes. If, if these works, these continuation works and, and these, these new works by old authors take people back, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, funnily enough, that's the concept that the show is named after that, you know, if you can't read anything, why read it all? Which we thought was so ridiculous that we named the show after it. <laughs> but Stella, it has been such a pleasure speaking to you after so many months and also uh, giving us an excuse to reread this book. Like I w oh, well looking done. for one. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, yeah, no, I, I'm totally with you on the um, the plotting. God, mm -hmm. I, I struggled. It's really hard. Um, and, and it was so funny hearing you talk about people. I've got no idea who they are with their rules about what to do. Um, <laughs> and I just know that you're not supposed to have the, the um, it, it be solved by it being a dream at the end. Mm -hmm. And at least I achieved that. Although it is Midsummer Night's Dream. So there you go. Stella Duffy there ending that clip from our bonus episode discussing Money in the Morgue, which is out now on the podcast just before this one discussing the devotion of Suspect X. But in a couple of weeks, it'll be moving back down in history to alongside our broader discussion of Money in the Morgue. Don't miss it. Or if you're catching up, go back and check that out. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We'll be back with more on the devotion of Suspect X in just a second.
You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are discussing Keigo Higashino's The Devotion of Suspect X, chapters 1 to 7. Herds, you're in the deep end. <laughs> and uh, what, do, what do you have to solve? Well, this is the question, isn't it? Because obviously it's not the murder. Um, at least not, like, who killed them with their own two hands. Mm-hmm. But I have to say, Flex, that I am moderately familiar with this kind of story. Um, I feel like uh. I feel like in the West, uh, the cat and mouse tale is more often told from an an action movie standpoint. Uh-huh. Um, but this particular story is incredibly evocative um, of of one story that I have watched multiple times now. Uh, it's a little a little a little story, a little cartoon from from the East, uh, known as Death Note. Um, which oh, goodness. I know, I know you thought I would get a chance to bring this back, but here we are. <laughs> so Death Note is about a essentially a mass murdering psychopath who wants to build a new world order, because that's all the anime characters want to do these days. But there's this, like, idiosyncratic, uh, antisocial, s- strange, morally autistic genius character who's trying to catch him. And... In, to, in order to orchestrate, you know, the catching of this psychopathic criminal, he enrolls in the same school as his character. And there is a rather strange series of episodes where they, like, play tennis with each other and, like, play board games. And it's, like, framed as this very dramatic back and forth between these two, like, super genius minds as they do mundane tasks, which is fantastic, by the way. It's very weird. Yes. But I have to say, I'm getting very similar vibes from this story. So I'm, I'm just going to say out the gate, I think that the uh, the mystery in this story, it's not about who physically killed Togashi. It's about who has, uh, let's say, uh, orchestrated the killing of Togashi. I think that that is the more important point. Because Ishigami, I'm going to let you know... Uh, he's he's creepy as heck, um, and uh, even in the most recent chapter with the introduction of, of um, Yukawa's love interest, we can see that she's worried that he's being controlling of her, and I think that this is setting up the fact that she's going to realize that he has had a hand in events. Now, I'm not sure exactly how this has happened. So, so you're suggesting, you're suggesting that the reason the ex-husband shows up in the first place is because he was laid breadcrumbs by Ishigami so that he would show up, so that they would kill him, yeah. so that he could then get with her. I, th- I think that the ploy was that either he had planned on, like, saving her from him, she'd, like, run out of the house and he'd save her, uh-huh. or that this, like you know, they're going to be criminally investigated. I'm going to have to step in with my my brilliant genius mind and save them that way. Like, I think that this is part of his, like, twisted way of connecting with another human being. His situation isn't very good. No. I think that for him, like, this woman is his only obsession. It's the only thing he cares about. That's the title, The Devotion of Suspect X. Because in this situation, Yasuko, I think, is... uh, despite like being framed as the suspect X character mm-hmm. and that her devotion is to her child, I think that the ending of the novel is going to reveal that the the suspect X, the the ultimate like criminal character, mm. is Ishigami and that this whole thing, like orchestrating this whole thing, has been because he just wants to to love someone desperately and like get out of all these other problems he's been having. Interesting. That's that's where I'm feeling. Okay, okay. It, it's it's a tough point to be at herds because I think that on the one hand, yeah, the thematics of the novel so cleanly logically leads to where you're going that it, it you know it, it's hard it's hard to bite back at you here. Okay, herds. okay, fair enough. The difficulty I'm having here though is you have come into this comparing it to what is kind of an action thriller type. <laughs> I guess. Uh, at least as far as I understand Death Note. Sure. And you even said that it's the cat and mouse is more often played out in action stories. And my my criticism of your theory is here, Herds, that do you really think that in a novel that is as slow and methodical as this, that uh, 
you know, that it's going to be so, so expansively orchestrated. The whole point of the theory that Ishigami and uh, Detective Galileo discuss is that you have a clean, simple solution. Sure. And surely this sounds too complicated to be something that Ishigami would be keen for. I mean, in my mind, like, all he would have to do is say, hey, Togashi, that's that's where that's where your ex-wife lives. You should go, like, pay her a visit. Like, I feel like that's all you would need to do. I guess it is possible that he's just taking advantage of the situation. Either one, I guess, is just as likely. If if this story is true to the the formula that I've uh, that I'm basing this on, then it's probably going to be not through his own like specific error, but through the error of uh, or or maybe deliberate action of of Yasuko or Masato that's going to give him away rather than his own like lack of brilliance. Mm. There there was some there was some stilted dialogue where Yasuko asked Ishigami like, "So you heard us through the wall, did you?" And he said. And did the what with the what now? Like, <laughs> like I feel like he he didn't hear. He just knew. I feel like that's that's what that's supposed to indicate. Ah, so you think the lie is not that is not that the walls are in fact not soundproof, but rather that uh that he knew all along it was happening. Yeah, it's in that's that's where I'm feeling. That's where I'm kind of vibing right now. The the other thing that that raises hurts yeah. that I'm kind of interested to discuss here in this mystery section is so far it feels like there is so much set dressing oh going on in this mystery. That's the fun which, part. Which you know <laughs> obviously obviously hurts yeah. is going to uh displease one Sir Van Dyne. I have no problem with it. Look, you know me. <laughs> I think that there's enough because we kind of go back and forth. We we don't spend a lot of time on the actual murder mystery, on the details of it. We go back and forth between the set dressing, which is all very fun. Shout out to the can man. The best character. The can man. He introduced in the first character, comes back in like the seventh. There is a can man. Uh-huh. He's great. Um, and, and also between these like very heavy in-depth dialogues between the characters. And to me, this is the perfect mix of, of story versus character versus world building. Because we don't waste any time talking about the plot. We just experience it, which is beautiful. Yeah, I, I would never dispute what you've just said there, that this balance is really good. The thing that interests me, though, yeah. is that in a novel that is still ostensibly meant to be a mystery by the way that it's marketed, with so much set dressing going on, how does Keigo Higashino bring about all of this set dressing? What becomes of Can Man? <laughs> there, are so many, there are so many loose threads in this novel thus far that I... I'm I'm curious as to how you think Keigo Higashino sure. can bring them all back together I at mean, the end. If if that is the case, if they are bringing them all back, I mean the most straightforward way would be that Gallo, you know, stands in front of Ishigami at the end and is like, "I remember when we had this scene and I did these things. You thought I was looking for this information, but I actually was looking for this information because <laughs> Ishigami, I was the can man well, all well, along. Well, this is the thing, right?" <laughs> Ishigami even has a line where he he says a bunch of stuff to Galileo and then he thinks to himself like have I said anything important I don't think so and to me I don't even, I don't remember what he said so I couldn't tell you what it was but when he says like <laughs> I haven't said anything important I'm like there was something important there like you just gave away the game with whatever you just said I don't know what it was but I'll, <laughs> I'll have to go back through it for sure for next week yeah all right so herds your challenge for this week, Tell me. and honestly for next week- I was going to say, we're running out of time. Is that I'm just going to make this mystery worth two points. Okay, sure. Because, and we'll deliberate this when we get to the end, but I'm concerned, Herds, that if I was to give you another puzzle in the next week, I would be leading the witness too much. Okay, sure. So, Herds, this this mystery truly is the double or nothing. Must be a hard mystery then. I'm in trouble. I- well, we 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 we'll we'll talk about that as we go forwards, oh, Herds. I no. think you'll I think you'll uh you you'll have a bit of hither and tither on how you feel about the the way this novel presses on. I'm so ready. That means it's gonna be something <laughs> crazy from left field. I'm super ready for this. Let's go. So next week on the show, Herds, we are going to be discussing chapters eight to fourteen. Oh, nice even uh, number of chapters. How many chapters are there total in this novel? Nineteen. Nineteen. That doesn't leave us much for the finale. I hope it's explosive. I, I'm uh, I'm excited to get to it, Herds. I think uh, you know this is a bit of a different read because we already know who the culprit is. Yeah. We already know what's going on. 
Um, so we'll see how things turn out. Well, that's what I'm excited for. I, I love a murder mystery that shakes up the status quo, you know, that takes takes the rules and twists them and turns them. And especially having a, a cat and mouse game um, between these two geniuses who are probably both, you know, equally smart, but approach problems in such completely different ways. You know, I'm excited to see uh, how the human element plays into the solution here. I completely agree, Herds. Thank you for joining us here on Death of the Reader. It has been a pleasure, as always, having you join us. We'll be back with more of The Devotion of Suspect X by Keigo Higashino next week. You're listening to 2SER.